สวัสดี May I pay my respect to พระอาจารย์สุชาญอสุชน from Aberdeen and today we have invite พระอาจารย์ to come and speak to us about Buddhism in Scotland and monks life and Buddhist engagement in in Aberdeen or in Scotland so we are very fortunate to have พระอาจารย์สุชน to Be with us here today to talk to us. And may I first of all introduce a bit of um, Ajahn Pra Ajahn uh, Suchon, you know. And Pra Ajahn Suchon originally he is from Nepal, but he was studying in Thailand for many years. Uh, he completes his uh, MA and BA as um, Hajula Longkorn Raja Vidyalaya British University in Thailand. Then he came to The, the UK and he stayed in Aberdeen and he studied in uh, Aberdeen University and finished his another MA there. So then uh, Prajan Suchan has been uh, staying at Aberdeen uh, Vihara for how many years already, Ajahn? It's been uh, since 2012. Since 2012, yes, since 2012, eight, nine years already. Eight, Prajan, nine, yeah, yeah, Prajan Suchan, uh, Suchan's there. So today we will um, ask, and we will have, um, you know, good opportunity to listen from Prajan about the uh, his life, a Buddhist monk's life over there, because as we, you know, seen always in online that Prajan is always to. Uh, a lot of you know Buddhist activities, doing you know teaching online, teaching kids, visiting uh, school like this at the at the, uh, at the uh, Vihara. So today, may I first of all, Prajan, can you speak a bit, a little bit about yourself and the Vihara? Then we go to uh, the you know the uh, topic that we are going to talk today. Uh, may mm -hmm. you please tell a little bit of yourself, Prajan Sutra. Thank you very much, uh, Venerable Brahmaha Sena, for inviting me to be part of this uh, education uh, Zoom meetings. Well, uh, as 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 Ajahn uh, mentioned, I was born in Nepal and uh, ordained as a novice in Nepal and went to Thailand for several years, studying, became a, a monk over there, and came to UK in 2005. And ever since, stayed in different temples, different places, and uh, end up being here in Aberdeen. Uh, so some people say this Aberdeen is very cold, but I feel very warm in their hearts. All right, so, so <laughs> that you get a lot of warmth from uh, people visiting you, Ajahn. Yes, yeah. That's good. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. And after I established uh, this center. I wanted to know how the Western people think about religion and how the society is turning towards the secure, secure, secularism, secularism. So then I joined the master's degree here, but uh, this so-called religion and society, uh, oh, simply right. to learn the Western society and Western religion, uh, and. Uh, As that made me uh, comfortable uh, speaking or even mingle with the modern society here in the West. That's great, Prajan. Okay. Prajan, today, um, as I mentioned to you a bit, um, we're going to talk about your life, your monk's life in, in Aberdeen in Scotland and uh, you know, Buddhist engagement in Aberdeen that where you are you know, um, occupied or doing there. Mm -hmm. And then mainly we we'll talk about a short story of uh, Buddhism in Scotland, which is you, you just told me that uh, uh, the Buddhism in Scotland is your uh, your thesis or your dissertation for your MA, isn't it, Prajan? At the um... yes, that's true. And when I was doing this religion and society uh, in a, um, social science, and I thought that since I'm going to work here, I wanted to know what is the situation of this Buddhism here in Scotland and as well as what is the perception that the Scottish people or in Scotland has. So and that's why uh, uh, Buddhism in Scotland in particularly Theravada Buddhism, I did a 
uh, on that dissertation about uh, the adaptation and introduction in this um, uh, Theravada Buddhism in, uh, in, in, in Scotland. Right. So yeah, Prajan, we will come back to this uh, uh, later. Then we're going to talk about, um, yes, about Buddhism in Scotland, how many temples, how many tradition, mm -hmm. and what about other tradition like this we're going to talk later. And yeah. the second topic is we'll be um, talking about uh, your work, engagement and commitment in, your, in the community, like the Buddhist community mm -hmm. at your temple mm -hmm. there. Your mm -hmm. routine at the temple, Dhamma class, meditation class, like that, mm -hmm. and maybe Buddhist service activities. Yeah. And the third uh, topic is outreach. It will be, you know, connection, your connection with other faith, interfaith, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. this, or teaching in different places, like in university, I believe you do that, yeah. and in school, like that. And the fourth one, the fourth item will be uh, school visit and visiting school. Sometimes we have school visit at our temple, isn't it, Prajan? Yeah. And yeah. then we also yeah. are invited to, to, to join, to teach in school sometime. Yeah. yeah. And student of what level they come to the temple and how many of them like this. And, uh, mm -hmm. and what is the most, uh, common questions, you know, as we are here, you know, me too, I'm here, you know, some, mm -hmm. some, some, some questions are really <laughs> lovely, Ajahn. Yeah. And do they, you know, always come back to the temple or do, uh, do yeah. they like, uh, like coming back to the temple, mm -hmm. just for mm -hmm. example. The fifth item would be how do you reach people during this COVID-19, Ajahn, it's difficult, you know, as like you do here. And how do uh, how do you tell people you know, to, keep, to cope with the depression, worry, anxiety, uh, and what sort, of, uh, what sort of dharma or the teaching of the Buddha do you recommend people you know, to mm -hmm. apply in their day-to-day uh, uh, -day life? Mm -hmm. This is uh, something like that. And the, maybe the very last one, we're going to talk a bit about the question that uh, that students always ask, like comment, <laughs> you know, okay. question, Pajan. As, as I also used to do here, Pajan, they also come to our temple. I also have uh, very similar to yours and things. Mm -hmm. Then, yes, we talk uh, this, uh, you know, one by one. Mm -hmm. So may we, first of all, you know, may I first of all uh, hear from you about uh, Buddhism in Scotland you can do a bit of, you know, uh, how Buddhism, you know, starting yeah. in the UK, yeah, well, and then we can go back to that. Prajan, can you go on? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, since you texted me uh, this morning about all details, what I should be prepared, <laughs> I rushed and uh, put it into <laughs> one small, a small into the uh, PowerPoint. So let me share that PowerPoint. Sure, and Prajan, we'll go thank through you. that yeah. PowerPoint. Yeah. Let okay. me, you cannot share. Yeah. And let me know if you see the PowerPoint. Uh, yeah, that's perfect, Prajan. That's right. Yeah? Okay. yeah, great. So, okay, here I named it on uh, after I got your message saying Buddhism in Scotland introduction and establishment, the case study of Warapunya Meditation Center. Good. Uh, so, and I again, you know, brought what the Buddha said about go forth because, you know, for the compassion, uh, out of compassion for the world and for the good benefit and happiness of good and uh, gods and amends. And that's again, Buddha was saying uh, preach, proclaim, host, and work for the good of the others. Um, this is from the, what the Buddha said. And uh, this is, I just wanted to give you how the Buddhist missionary came to Aberdeen or in Scotland. Yes. And a second, you know, Scotland being a part of the UK, uh, we are again have to go through how Buddhism introduced to the UK, and that I have, uh, you know, classified into uh, four different main topics here. As Buddhism came to UK through the and then a practical way, and then a mission, and organization yeah? from the academic way it started from the life of the Asia, the book uh, written by Sir Alan, and then the politics society, establishment of the politics society in 1881. 
you know, and then you know, uh, first uh, Buddhist, uh, first uh, English man to be become a Buddhist monk was in 1899 in Sri Lanka, who was the Douglas, Gordon Douglas, and then later as a mission, Buddhism came to UK. Uh, was that Alan Bennett who went to study in Sri Lanka for several years and then became a monk in Myanmar. And then later he came back to UK in 1908. And that's how Buddhism gradually established uh, as an institution uh, after his arrival in 1920s, then Buddhist society of the UK established. And I just had a glance of the, this uh, Buddhist organizations in the UK that in 1952, there were only five Buddhist centers in the UK, which increased by 371 by 200 uh, by uh, year 2003. So I presume this number already has grown up a lot, you know, probably now over 400 uh, Buddhist organizations in the UK. Okay. And in terms of the uh, and Buddhists uh, whole in the UK as 0.3%. And uh, Buddhism in the UK, in the West, how it came. So the uh, Mackenzie's writes uh, that in his book writes that uh, probably it came during the time of the Ahsoka. However, there is no concrete uh, evidence to show that Buddhism came during that time. But however, there are other uh, evidence shows you know, on and off Buddhism introduced in different forms uh, in the UK. But it's become more clear in 19th century and it became more popular in 20th century. Now, mm -hmm. Buddhism became a really uh, popular after the light of Asia uh, was published, uh, was written by Sir Edwin Arnold in 1979. You know? oh. And it's become a more stabilized or established as an institution after 1881. Okay. So, in terms of the uh, practical, from academia to practical way, uh, Buddhism uh, took place in the UK through the Gordon Douglas, who became the first uh, British person to become uh, became a, a monk in Theravada Buddhism, uh, and uh, as become a Bhikkhu Asoka and Alan Bennett, as I already said. So this is a the Scotland, uh, you know. And the part, the map is a uh, Scotland, and there is a. Uh, this is, as I said, it's a part of the United Kingdom. A larger city of uh, Scotland is Glasgow, and the capital city is Edinburgh. Uh, is Nicola Nicola Surgeon, and um, it was united with the United Kingdom in 1707. But now uh, Scotland has got uh, devolved. Uh, its own parliament since 1998. The population <laughs> in Scotland has a 550 million and in particular in Aberdeen, uh, just over 200,000. So these are other signs you can see the symbols of uh, Scotland. Yeah. And so, so Buddhism yeah. in Scotland, um, so Roden uh, uh, Gordia, he, he writes that it was started in 1912 uh, in a Theosophical Society in Edinburgh. I started to read the Buddhist uh, doctrines mm -hmm. as a part of their meetings. And then later after that year, Light of Asia been introduced and they started studying the Light of Asia. So that in a, base, in a way is the starting of Buddhism in Scotland. Yeah? So that's a 1912. And then with that, the census or the uh, population, Buddhist population, we can see that in Scotland by 2005, there were 0 0.13 and currently, you know, but they're mostly brought up as a Buddhist, only uh, uh, 46%. And other religions are basically there are more. And what, what interests me is the 14.2% who, claim themselves as uh, no religion, okay? oh. no religion. So that's, a, that's a my uh, point, the, which is very interesting point here. No religion, and, so non-religion. Yes. Yeah, non-religion, yeah. And so this is again, uh, um, 
a current religion and a religious upbringing uh, in Scotland. The Buddhists are so current religious only 0 0.13. Uh, and basically now, again, I believe it's been uh, uh, grown a bit higher than higher. Hindu, Ajahn. Yes, higher than Hindu, yeah. And you will be surprised to see that over 50% are white. Wow, oh, okay. Uh -huh. And this is the uh, um, invitation for me in 2012. Uh, and I was invited to give a, a, as a, a rep Buddhist representative in there. And I mentioned that it says yeah, the Buddhism has been, you know, over 2,500 years since the Buddha passed away. And his compassion of peace and compa oh, yeah. uh, message of peace, compassion, loving kindness has spread around the world. It was introduced to Scotland almost a century ago. So that was because 1912 and then that was 2012. So as exactly the century ago, uh, I mentioned that. And then, then I mentioned that, you know, today Buddhism is not here in Aberdeen. Uh, so I'm just uh, you know, narrowing down here to the Aberdeen saying that uh, it's not to convert anyone, but to convert from the misery to, you know, compassion, uh, so, so, sort of like that. And that was my first approach. And in terms of inst institutionalization of this Buddhism, you know, as I mentioned, the Buddhism was introduced as a discourse in 1914, 1912 to 1914, and then Buddhist society uh, opened its branch in 1952 in Edinburgh as a form of a body to organize the Vesak celebration, and which was, you know, very well established and a well-organized Vesak celebration uh, at that time. And later, um, the establishment of Johnson House, 1960s, and it was established by basically, you know, it's a, a Canadian monk, you know, his name was oh. Anand de Bodhi. But sadly, uh, he was unable to continue that uh, Johnson House as a Theravadin Institute. So he had to sell it later, you know, and then a Samiling took over. So that's why now Samiling become a really big organization in Scotland. Uh, it's in the borders and uh, they have a lot of uh, branches and a lot of followers too. And they organize and offer a lot of uh, uh, Buddhist studies and practices around in Scotland. So this is a Samiling, uh, it's a border, so it's very big. Uh, been a couple of time and I have been there for the retreats and as well as while I was there for the retreat, I managed to short out the uh, library books on the Theravada books. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, whenever they have a new books arrival from, Thera uh, from the Theravada uh, perspectives, normally the librarian uh, emails me to find out, is it uh, which section it should go like that. So uh, this is a sampling. So, have a connection with the librarian here. And uh, so uh, in 2015, uh, when I did my dissertation, I looked at the uh, buddhanet.net, uh, how many Buddhist organization registered in Scotland. And that time there was only 45 Buddhist organizations. And within that uh, six groups were, are classified as a Theravada Buddhism. And today, this morning, I checked it and found there are 47. So two Buddhist organizations has been registered in Buddha Net uh, so far after this um, you know, five years time. But I believe this is this should be more than that because I have seen a new Kadampa uh, center established in Aberdeen, Dhammakaya center established in Helensburg, uh, and then in Glasgow, another uh, Buddhist center established so like that, <laughs> but anyway, the whole this uh, you know, Buddhist centers, again, we can categorize into Chinese, Mahayana, Tibetan, Theravada, Zen, Zen. and as well as non-traditional, also uh, the new Kadampa tradition uh, there too. Right. So and then these Theravada monasteries, I uh, classify or uh, uh, divide into two, like ethnic based centers and non-ethnic based center. And here, ethnic based center, basically, I mean that it's heavily or strongly related to the origin of country like a Thailand or Sri Lanka. 
and whereas non-ethnic -ethn based center uh, are you know, not strongly related to the origin of their country. Yeah, great. So this is the first Theravada Buddhist uh, uh, center in Glasgow and established by Venerable Revata uh, in 2001. And uh, this, I have a very good relationship with this center and um, I also help running the uh, Dharma classes in this center too, uh, like over this two months time during the Vasa, uh, sorry, during the Vesak celebration, I was also helping giving a talks and a meditation. And then the last month of Poson, I was also you know, leading the chanting and guided meditation and giving the uh, talks on the life of the Buddha and like that. So normally, and again, I do visit uh, the center uh, quite often just to have a keep my relationship strong. So we work together and the uh, Venerable uh, Revata also uh, helping uh, as well. <clears throat> it seems they have all monks, they have uh, quite a few monks Venerable there at Sri Lanka no, Center. This, these two pictures are old picture, it's an opening picture. At the oh, moment right. he has got uh, only two. Okay. And this is a, a Thai temple, uh, Thai temples in, in Scotland. There are three Thai, you know, that, that this is the eth eth ethnic based uh, Theravadin centers. There are three Thai temples here. The one is in Dhammapadipa temple, which was established in 2003 as a branch of a Buddhapadipa temple in London. Yeah. And then later in 2011, Wat Thai Buddha Ram Temple was established in Aberdeen uh, uh, with the uh, help of uh, Dhammapadipa Temple in Edinburgh. And later, uh, and then later in 2008, I'm not sure whether the, the 2018 or 2017, the Dhammakaya Meditation Center established, but the official inauguration of the Dhammakaya Meditation Center or Dhammakaya Center in Helensburgh. Uh, took place in 2009, uh, 2018, the summer 2018. And I have visited so many times and uh, uh, went to offer and uh, and stay overnight uh, this uh, Helensburgh Dhammakaya Meditation Center quite often. And I again, I took my uh, devotees and go and have a look and, and uh, join with the, uh, the Dhammakaya uh, from before the inauguration when they bought this place. And so these are there, maybe uh, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe a big place, isn't it, Prajan? Mostly Dhammakaya, they have quite a uh, beautiful and, and quite a uh, yeah. big place. Yeah, in Helensburgh, they bought a, a big church uh, and converted it into the, uh, the monastery uh, and a meditation center. It's really big, huge. Mm -hmm. And they have worked so hard, you know, uh, converting it into the uh, a monk, uh, in a kind of a, um, the hall, uh, two halls, and they have worked really, really hard. I really admire uh, the monks and lay followers, those who are living uh, at the center. Yeah, and it's beautifully decorated now. Yeah. But, yeah and uh, last, last year, uh, la no, yeah. So last year, yeah, la last year visit, no, early Jan January, my visit, well, I went there again, you know, after all the renovation done, it's beautiful. Beautiful, the decorate is like gorgeous. Yeah. So simple, but elegant. Yes. <laughs> and this is a Buddhist center, and I would recommend, I would call it a non-ethnic based center because it accommodates all uh, Buddhists from around the world. Uh, although we do have a link with the Thailand, uh, but again, uh, like uh, the first one is Milnum Hermitage in Persia. It was established by uh, Achan Chandasuri, and who is uh, a Scottish, uh, oh. probably the first uh, nun uh, while the um, Achan Cha arrived in UK. Right. And, uh, now, in 2012, she bought this 11 acres of woodlands in a, in, in a Persia remote village and established it as a, a nunnery hermitage. And she normally stays there nowadays, although she travels to talk, uh, give her talks and run the retreats 
around in Edinburgh, Glasgow, uh, and even you know, going to Amrawati. Uh, but this is also kind of a branch from the Amrawati established there. Beautiful, beautiful. beautiful. And obviously, this uh, Warapunya Meditation Center, again, <clears throat> this, uh, we established this in 2012. Um, but we got the registration uh, from like a charity, a charitable uh, organization in 2013 as the Warapunya Meditation Center, a Buddhist society and meditation center. Again, <clears throat> in terms of the nunnery, uh, the, the, the hermitage, I, all, I along uh, uh, as well as other devotees do visit and uh, the, uh, attend the ceremonies and we also offer things to the, uh, the hermitage too. <clears throat> So some of these pictures uh, from our center. This is our small cottage with a uh, and five acres land. We have planted trees in a five acres land, wow. and every time when we have this uh, Sunday school or a, a children's retreat, we normally go for a walk. Uh, right. And we, I, I do have uh, this uh, uh, novice ordination every year. Uh, this year we haven't done it uh, because of the coronavirus. Um, actually, we have uh, two candidates living at the center who is helping at the center, uh, but we cannot do the ordination. In the meantime, every year I take uh, friends and uh, devotees for a walk and a mountain walk about a week. And this is one of the pictures from uh, 2018. Yeah, do mountain after... climbing, mountain hiking, isn't it there? A uh, kind of a hiking, uh, but, uh, but it's more of like a normal walk and uh, and stay together and uh, learn and uh, learn together uh, for one week. Um, stay in the forest for one week, Rajan, in the mountain. Yes. Wow. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, in terms of the activities uh, at the center, we normally have a six o'clock meditation, uh, chanting and meditation and 11.30 traditional food offering, you know, and uh, seven o'clock we have evening chanting and meditation. So this is a daily routine that I, we, ha we have here at the center. And in terms of the weekly, before the coronavirus, we normally have a Tuesdays and Wednesdays uh, evenings, uh, seven to nine o'clock meditation for, sorry, open to the public and uh, people normally come from uh, various and it's uh, this is like open open sessions sometimes you will get uh, two people or other time get 10 people you know it's uh, based on the weather and uh, people's uh, intention and we have a saturday uh, saturday meditation in the morning at the 9 to 11 o'clock which is again there, there won't be any uh, much talking just uh, come and sit and walk meditation and a Sunday uh, group meditation at 10 to 11 o'clock. And uh, <clears throat> we do have a study of a script, scripture and a reflection and sort of thing. And there are some pictures I just wanted to show you that this is a Dharma school at the center and we have a volunteers helping. Um, mm -hmm. And these uh, children mostly are uh, from a Sri Lankan background. Mm. And uh, they, we also go for arms uh, every Tuesdays and Wednesday uh, at, in in a city uh, here in a, in a village as well as in the city. But in the village we have stopped uh, for a year now. Uh, but in the city we continue uh, go uh, arms. Um, whoever comes to visit the center here, I normally take them with me to go for arms as well, just to. Right. give them uh, in a different flavor of going arms in the western cities <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and sometimes you will get a good uh, conversation with the visitors with the visitors uh, yes uh, 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 do you do you need to do appointment with uh with a devotee to do this kind of like uh bintapata or or go for arms in the city no, Bante, we do every day. So whoever right. okay. want to give, uh, so we, we do every Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So uh, whoever wants to give, then they can wait in that okay. route that we have allocated. So uh, 
that's how we organized it. So it's not a make up like a event then it's just you no. do this like rally. Yeah, it's yeah, it's been a, regularly every Tuesdays and Wednesday we do that. Uh, it's been a routine now and every people around that area knows about it. So mm -hmm. it might be a surprise for the uh, like um yeah, you know visitors and you know you know people walking around well, yes, it, it was, and it did as well. In the meantime, I, whenever I go to talk and give a, uh, give a talks and uh, uh, lead the meditations in different organizations, I normally tell them that you might bump into me in the morning when, while I was uh, going for arms. And if you see me, do not ignore me, you know, like that. <laughs> yes. so with that. You know, it made them more comfortable and we also feel more comfortable. Uh, and in the past, when in 2013, 14, you know, I even during the summertime, uh, when the sunshine and no, not much cold, I wear a robe and just walk in the cities just yes. to let them know our existence. Yes. And with that, many people feel comfortable. And sometimes I sit with the homeless people and talk with mm -hmm. them. Oh. You know, and with that, uh, they in Aberdeen, uh, pretty much people know monks' uh, uh, existence now. Yes. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> and your and, way of dress as well, isn't it, Prajan? Yeah, yeah. 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 And this is one of the events uh, in uh, uh, this is uh, this Vesak celebration uh, yeah. in our center we organized. And this is how we uh, separate and uh, lay down our events normally. Uh, normally, uh, and this this again event we hire the hall, so we organize in the hall. Uh, and this was the uh, last year's katina katina ceremony, and this is again at the same place, the same hall that we or, uh, we hired. And so every year we hire this Katina ceremony, uh, this hall for the Katina ceremony and Vesak celebration. Right. And this is, uh, again, this is uh, uh, this, uh, a few days ago, as uh, a Asala Puja uh, uh, event. Uh, so at the center also every important days uh, uh, during the lunchtime, uh, we go for arms and let the uh, devotees stand outside of the center and then monks will go and collect the food from them. So this was uh, la uh, just a, uh, a sal puja day. In terms of the outreach, uh, I have here uh, set, uh, categorized into the five uh, topics. One is monthly mindfulness Mondays. Uh, but again, remember that this is before the uh, coronavirus, okay? okay? This is before the coronavirus programs. So this monthly Mindfulness Mondays uh, that again, in partnership with the NHS and Aberdeen City and Health Partnership and Grampian, we've been offering it uh, every month uh, since 2016 and around 40 to 50 people join every month. Mm -hmm. And it, they have to register with the NHS mm -hmm. and most of them are referred by doctors, psych uh, psychiatrists, uh, mm -hmm. and counselors so they come and everyone are anonymous you know nobody uh, nobody knows apart from the nhs and some can drop by as well uh, if they got the email from nhs and this program uh, we don't have to promote nhs promotes it and nhs mm -hmm. provides the, uh, the space all what we do is to go and teach okay and, and the second from this monthly mindfulness Mondays, we developed this six weeks learning mindfulness meditation course. And again, we hire our own, own space in the city, giving uh, this opportunity for those who have learned and wanted to uh, learn more. And it's been a six weeks course. Now we have completed five groups of them. Uh, and uh, on after we have done this six weeks mindfulness courses, then we have also hired the one month the support group meditation. Those who have done the courses, they can come and practice in that uh, hall as well. So this six week course and this meditation support group. Now I don't have to go, go and teach them. Um, we ha I have uh, the, uh, David 
who was uh, training under me for a couple of years now. He is quite qualified to teach and he's teaching there and I will be there just the helping and you know, gi you know giving the first day, middle and the end. I will be there to support and also after the end of the six week, they will come to the center for the last you know, three hours meditation and the kind of discussion. And then as being a chaplain at the Aberdeen University, uh, we have started this uh, weekly meditation center, meditation drop by uh, dropping in as well. And this is also, I don't have to go and teach every week. Uh, one of my students, Matthew, he uh, teaches there on behalf of me. Uh, there and then occasionally mon once a month I go and uh, uh, just to, uh, for the question and answer uh, answers. Apart from these uh, regular courses, there are uh, short courses in Aberdeen City, Wooden Hospital and other private organizations. And uh, some of the private organizations, uh, when they invite me, then normally now I refer it to uh, my student or uh, my student who had uh, practiced. So it's David, he normally, uh, David or Lena, uh, they go and uh, give a mindfulness meditation on behalf of the center. Yeah. So some of the pictures here, and this picture, this was the first time ever that the monks got a special visit to the city council chamber and the Lord Provost himself uh, welcomed and gave the briefings of the Aberdeen city and how the Aberdeen city works. So this was the very first time I was very pleased to organize this one. And uh, this one again, Alwine School, where I visited a lot uh, and I was invited to give um, uh, talks on Buddhism a lot. And all the questions that one of the, one of the events that I was invited and they asked me several questions, around 30 questions, and I compiled that questions into a book. Uh, this, uh, your questions and my answers. So this book, and later I got the, uh, the help from Taiwan and got published. And, published. Yeah. Okay. Okay. and after and the after publication, the this uh, uh, book, uh, we had an uh, you know, official launch in the uh, Albine School and uh, also this book been distributed around over 60 or 70 schools around the Northeast Scotland uh, as a, a handbook for them to study in a Buddhist concept. Uh, so this is the uh, book. This is your book, isn't it, Venerable? It is, yeah. I, I compiled from the questions that students ask me. That's wonderful. I really want to have one. <laughs> I will send it to you. Uh, I will yeah, send it to please. you. Yes. So this book, that's why this book's been uh, you know, distributed to the around 60 to 70 schools in Scotland as a, a book, a reference book. And from there, I have also compiled another small uh, books on morality that student asked. The, based on the students' questions, I have compiled that book as well, but I haven't published it yet because I just wanted to refresh it more uh, into the details. So that's why it's not published yet. Good. And this is school. I normally go and give the talks and uh, on a Buddhism and also give a, a meditation for the staffs as well. Okay. And this is again the Port Lathan Academy, the, the top picture. I go every year uh, as an interfaith uh, part and giving a, a, a Buddhist views on different topics related to the modern world. And I also became a part of creating this, uh, uh, this CD, uh, the interfaith CD uh, in, this, in, in, in the school and which was also presented uh, in Anna Frank's uh, event in Aberdeen every year. And we have a Scots visit at the center down and then the next one, uh, the next picture is Albine School uh, for the secondary schools. Right. Uh, Sorry for this is little mess. I haven't organized this one. So this is the, the pictures. I haven't organized the pictures. This is basically uh, annual interfaith mindful day uh, because I am uh, uh, very close to the Aberdeen interfaith for a long time. Wow, and okay. it's been uh, 
since uh, since I am very involved in interfaith and I wanted to do something related to Buddhism and meditation, so I introduced this annual interfaith mindful day at the center. So we will invite all the faith, different faiths to come to the center and to do the different activities. And this is one of the activities from last year. And this year we had, so this, yeah, this is from last year. Uh, we had a, a tree planting, walking meditation, and there's a music. Uh, so this, the whole day program, uh, I've been doing it uh, every year. So it's been a third year now. And this year we did in a Zoom. Uh, this year's uh, topic was sleep and relax. Venerable, this is the whole pictures, the whole events and activities are uh, uh, were in in your compound, in your premise, in your land, isn't it, Venerable? There. Yes, this whole picture is in our uh, the center's okay. compound. Yeah, okay. inside the center's compound. And this is the uh, mindful Mondays that I was talking about, and it was a uh, an a. Uh, on the news for the NHS you know, Grampian. You are on the news. Yeah, on the front page. And I was interviewed and I had an audience with the sports and health minister of Scotland as well, you know, explaining about what are the activities that we had uh, and what we are offering to the uh, Aberdeen. And these are other, uh, you can see the, uh, the pictures uh, how we've been working uh, and this has been really, really good uh, from the community uh, in terms of teaching the Mindfulness Mondays. And this is uh, six weeks learning mindfulness meditation at the Credo, which again also funded now by the NHS Grampian. Um, yeah. <clears throat> this is also all the courses are free of charge. All what we do is go and teach. Uh, <clears throat> So this is also <clears throat> the the previous the last course, yeah, the credo, and this was a well-being event in Robert Gordon University. Uh, I uh, taught like uh, two sessions of a meditation for two groups of people there, uh, and there were about over uh, altogether around four, over forty people uh, joined this uh, event. And this was at the Aberdeen University and last year. And this is the mindful libraries uh, and that we uh, that I used to go and teach in the libraries. And later on, I also had a chance to be part of the study, so-called, sorry. Uh, yes, sir. So so-called the li uh, mindful libraries. And with on the basis of that, I also have compiled a book called Hong Han Sati. Yeah, so this book, oh, I yes. compiled and I wrote it in Thai. I wrote yeah. it in Thai and published last year uh, on the basis of that experience of teaching uh, meditation in uh, mindful libraries. It was published 3,000 copies in Thailand and distributed in Thailand. And this is weekly meditation at the Aberdeen Chaplaincy Center that I was talking and uh, where again, I don't have to go and teach every week. Uh, Matthew, he uh, takes control and he teaches there and I will be there to you know, question and answer. And this is a health village. Uh, this health village again, uh, regular uh, teaching there every month. And there are a city council event, city council again, uh, I teach uh, two, section, uh, two uh, sets of uh, people. Uh, so each section will be half an hour teaching in the city council. And now again, there are other, uh, in a few, few months, uh, I think next month, we are going to start from the Zoom uh, for that rather than uh, going there. Okay. In terms of the humanitarian support, uh, ever since uh, we established the center, we're giving the food to the homeless people. So in the past we cook ourselves and then about 50 cooked food and 50 uncooked food. We take it to the Instant Neighbor Charity Center and uh, we offer this for the homeless. And this is in combination, a collaboration with the Interfaith Aberdeen and uh, St. Mary Cathedral Catholic Church uh, mm -hmm. every year. 
I go and help uh, to feed the homeless people. Okay. And this picture from last year, uh, last year, Christmas time, Christmas dinner for the uh, homeless people. Right. And this is uh, one of the events organized uh, by the mother, world, uh, mother language, international mother language in the, in the council. So I went to teach there and there was a 50 plus event organized by city council in the past and then uh, each each um, section each time each hours that when i was teaching there were around over 100 participants uh, for the meditation and that meditation i call mindfulness in the, on the move and here these items um this man is uh, he wanted to have some items for the library and the museum and he came to visit me and asks for the items to uh, to display in the museum. So I gave these uh, robe, book, singing bowl, Buddha, and uh, the ball, uh, and also palm leaf as a uh, um, uh, items to be displayed in the uh, in the uh, Aberdeen museum. museum. And now this is stored uh, with my voice and explanation of these things. What are they? So whenever there are religious events, then they will bring that and display and run the introduction to this. And this is another event that I uh, join uh, with the Lord Provost. You know? And this, this is a Tasi Limpo uh, dance uh, came from Tibet, uh, displaying uh, the, uh, the dance, Tibetan dance. Uh, so, and then, I was also there invited as a special guest along with the Lord Provost of Abdin and was attending that event. And here, this man from uh, Abdin, and he also came to a center and meditation and study Buddhism. And later, he wanted to test a Buddhist life, uh, become a monk. So, and after I trained him, he went to Thailand to become a monk for 10 days. His name is Colin, and now he come back. He ha he has come back to Aberdeen, and uh, uh, is still following Buddhist practices. And this is extra a uh, little bit of a <laughs> right. outdoor event. <laughs> and these are some of the uh, literature that uh, we have published uh, so far. Uh, uh, so just to give uh, give uh, uh, public to know what is buddhism and the meditation in particularly meditation so okay. this is again one of the chinese uh, devotees translated the morning chantings uh, whenever she comes with her family then she would uh, do her chanting with these translations mm -hmm. okay. and in, during this covid time uh, i offer a daily reflection talk at half past six uh, and the Pali chanting, seven o'clock, guided meditation, half seven, uh, and uh, teaching uh, Buddhism for the kids every Saturday at two to four p.m. and a regular meeting with a Scotland uh, interfaith group. In terms of helping COVID-19, and I have distributed around 500 face masks uh, oh. and also <clears throat> visiting uh, uh, the elderly people in their house and giving uh, food and also checking uh, their uh, lifestyles and also I normally speak and you know, talking on the phone a lot during this COVID-19 right. uh, with people dealing with their children problem dealing with their stress problem yes. you know, and so 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 and most of the talks uh, that I normally give every night uh, again based on that and also the questions I got it from the listeners uh, so, and that's how I am dealing with, uh, and even in our center during this time, we are um, you know, working with the barn to convert it into like a multi uh, activity center. So we can use it after the COVID-19 as a place to get the people and with a mindful of social distance, they can use that hall. So that's going on at the moment. Uh, and uh, we have a kitchen garden where general public or our members come and work there, plant their uh, vegetables and uh, 
kind of thing. So this is what's in there. Uh, so, and as you have put me other questions here as well. Uh, so why <laughs> Buddhists pay respect to the icon? I, we can go with later. Uh, do you have, yes. So I think I will conclude here yes, with yes, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Buddhism in Scotland and as well as what the center is doing and what my okay. involvement in this uh, work. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Thank you. You can you can put it down <clears throat> the slide. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Ajahn. Yeah, Ajahn Suchan. We have you know when now Venerable uh, Dr. Panya Poka uh, from Uni uh, Mahidon University in Thailand. Then uh, actually he is like um, moderator, you know, co-moderator <laughs> with me every day. Today he's, uh, he was a bit busy before that and uh, he came in now, yes. Then, yes, we were, whenever we were talking you know, about, you know, whenever we were talking about the Buddhism in Scotland, Scotland. whenever is from Warabunya uh, Buddhist Meditation Center in Scotland, he's original from Nepal. Then, yes, what, uh, Venable, what you just um, told or given your presentation to us is very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. And uh, I've learned a lot from this. And it's a lot of activities you do and a lot of activities you've been, you know, working there in, uh, in Scotland. Yeah, Venable, one of the um, most interesting thing that I would like to you to talk a bit about is that about the uh, like the 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 student like the visit at your temple. This I think is more interesting, and you are always like uh, teaching and doing regularly with uh, you know the uh, you know the, the you know the children or schools there. Eh? So if sometime they ask you the question, you know, because they have many types, many kinds of questions, you know, we were asked. Like, um, like we said earlier there, Venerable, why uh, we pay, why Buddhists pay respects uh, to icon or to Buddha statues, which is, you know, actually in the way of their you know, will is that you know it's not quite right you know to just bound or pay to the to the things or to the to the stage like that so if they ask you like that venerable what what you um, give them you know the answer what kind of answer how do you how do you you know satisfy them with the answer venerable mm. thank you thank you for the question uh, well, basically, in our center, every year, two schools visit. Uh, two schools visit as a regular visitors from uh, International Aberdeen School and uh, another primary school. And occasionally, we have a scout visit. Scout, yeah. Whereas, I normally visit Alban School quite regularly and also Port Leighton Academy and other uh, primary and secondary schools. Okay. And in terms of the questions that I receive, it based on like if the primary schools, they will ask you, why do you have to wear robes? Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, and uh, can a female become a monk? Or yeah, why can, always, yes. Yeah, and why do we have to shave your hairs? Uh, uh, those are the no, normal questions from the primary school children got. And in terms of the secondary school, they are more like uh, vegetarian. Are you vegetarian? Uh, what about the uh, uh, Buddhism, whether it was in, imposed or forced on the children? Uh, uh, or is Buddhism uh, is like, uh, what do you say, has God or not? And these are in the secondary school level questions. I got it. And um, in terms of uh, the question that you have just mentioned, uh, why do we pay respect to the Buddha or Buddha as an idol or not? And this question, whenever they ask me, I normally give them a 
simile that yeah. uh, we pay respect to the father and mother because they have given us the uh, this food and look after us and take care of us and with that you know, as a Buddha you know one who has given us this path to know the reality to know the truth uh, uh, so we pay respect to him as a teacher rather than the God and uh, we pay respect to him to show our gratitude that how much he has done out of compassion he has shown the path to find the real happiness mm. so that is uh, my approach uh, to, 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 to them that is yeah, very interesting you know, as you know, you know we uh, yeah. have many different kinds of uh, question <clears throat> yeah. and um, sometimes they also um, come with uh, with a big group how how big group i mean how many students and uh, staff they come to your temple or you accommodate our... them yeah yeah, because our our living room or this uh, shrine room is small, uh, I normally allow them to have around 20 or no, tw maximum is 30 uh, pupils. And uh, so the in Aberdeen International School normally comes with like a 40, uh, sorry, a 60 or 70. Then I have to divide into two groups. So they are coming into two groups. Uh, right. <clears throat> two groups and then I give the same teachings uh, to both as you know, as much as possible I try to introduce the same uh, same same uh, topics so they can relate to it yeah. and yeah. in terms of the regular meditation classes during before the COVID-19 you know, uh, <clears throat> Aberdeen University students also regularly visits for the meditation like four or five people uh, come for meditation and discussions and from that discussion and regular uh, uh, meditation uh, two of uh, Aberdeen University student last year uh, 2018 yeah so yeah last year they become a, a monk as well so a novice monk at the center and stayed for a, a, about 21 one stayed 20, 20 three weeks and then another one stayed about uh, 30 30 days and one of them also did his dissertation on the basis of his experience of being a monk, being a novice monk and training at the center, uh, right. like that. <clears throat> Venerable, when they come, sometimes they, you know, they are observing in a, in a shrine room, they have <laughs> like a kind of questions. They see sometimes we offering, we offer the Buddha with flowers, with flutes, or with other, you know, buja. Mm -hmm. So how how do you um, how do you answer them? How do you you know uh, give them the uh, answer about this one? I think in terms of uh, offering the candles and uh, flowers and incense, uh, this is like a basic. Uh, mostly uh, secondary school question they are normally asked when they see it yeah and uh, my response is always that you know it starts from like a, 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 our, our Buddhist way of an explanation of the three incenses are the qualities of the Buddha that mm -hmm. <coughs> sorry <coughs> the three qualities of the Buddha that doesn't need to anything to you know make you smell and it it doesn't classify or divide one to another it uh, everyone in the room or everywhere they can feel this sense of uh, the uh, the scent of the candle uh, the uh, incenses whereas the two candles normally is signifying you know the, the light to see through in the darkness uh, as mm -hmm. the teachings of the buddha also divide into the ultimate and uh, you know the conventional that leads us towards the enlightenment which is the uh, the ultimate goal in buddhism <clears throat> and the flower in terms of the flower again i normally bring them together as explaining that look at you are you all come from different places but when okay. we are coming together beautiful so the flower too as a flower we offer it in a form of a unity that we're coming from different backgrounds <laughs> 
But once we come into the Buddhism, we make the society harmony in the practice. And in the meantime, it also teaches us to know that everything must go. A change is always there. So this is my approach towards, you know, the, to, to the secondary school students when they see these three uh, main items in, in front of the Buddha. But in terms of the offering of food, I think this is more of a like a grown-up question or more of a, like a philosophical question. Those who know Buddhism normally wants to ask about it and wants to debate about it that Buddha didn't or Buddha already attained the Nirvana. He won't be able to come and eat it. Uh, and we are not offering to the devas and a Buddha wasn't the deva. And why do we have to offer? <clears throat> it's something like a confrontation form of a question is here. So yeah. and uh, my approach always is that uh, we have a different level of understanding. Someone has got the intellectual understanding and someone needs need more physical, like empirical and uh, you know, uh, when we can touch touchable uh, items to feel the connectedness with the, the, the with the religion or with the spirituality. So that's why the, the form of offering food is basically offering in from our heart yes. to connect yes. with the, the Buddha, not as one who is coming to eat it, but as sowing our devotion and our confidence in the teachings. And sometimes, again, people will say, you know, well, Buddha didn't uh, encourage it, did it, you know, like that. Then my response was, Buddha never said not to do it. No. Buddha simply, you know, Buddha said there are two ways of uh, worship. Worshipping by offering the items, objects, and worshipping by practicing. So it's up to individual which one, which way one has, one, one wants to go with it. So, but the offering is like a ritual to connect with the teachings and also connect with the, uh, the Buddha. So that's why this is how I approach uh, in this way. Yeah. Yes, as I observe, Venerable, <clears throat> when they come, different group, they have like uh, different, different, you know, the different wisdom, let's say, different understanding, you know, as the level of them and maybe you know, from government school or from you know, private school, they are a bit different sometimes. Yeah, quite, uh, they have more questions um, yeah. than pri from private school yeah. and uh, more like scientific and more philosophy and, you know, higher questions sometimes. Yes, uh, and I observe for this one as well. Yeah. And so that's why this book, this book has <coughs> yeah. uh, been really helpful for all the schools. That's why it's been distributed yes, uh, because it's based on their questions. So, yeah. Yeah, I will want one one day with that. Right? I will send it to you. <laughs> Please, yeah. yes. Um, yeah, one of our students here, he asked just last week, you know, I just give online, um, like online un question answer with the Modern School here. Mm -hmm. and uh, quite a uh, philosophy one as well but this one also you know this question is very interesting do you think it's possible to become enlightened without being buddhism without being buddhist so mm -hmm. this is you know is is <laughs> quite yes so they they, yeah. they they think sometime as a monk you know as as they asked me how long i've been a monk that I told them since I was small and until now more than 30 years. Oh, are you enlightened? Yeah. Are you enlightened? <laughs> yes, that is a kind of question. So that's question also, you know, Venerable. Is it possible yeah. for everyone to become um, an enlightened one? And yeah. How do we do that? That is the you know, that yeah. question. Sometimes. I think I, I got this question as well uh, a few, few years ago uh, when I was in uh, uh, secondary school giving a talk uh, about the dukkha uh, and uh, he uh, one of one of the questions was this too and uh, my response was that being a buddhist doesn't mean that you you will be enlightened yes, you know? right. and uh, uh, being a non-buddhist again doesn't mean that you cannot be enlightened too and uh, as long as even the buddha said as long as one who is practicing in line with the eightfold noble path then they don't have to call themselves a Buddhist. 
but they can be enlightened if they are genuinely practicing you know with their confidence faith and confidence mm -hmm. certainly there there is a possibility of becoming uh, uh, enlightened and there are you know uh, hundreds of thousands of people are yeah. buddhists but uh, how much they practice uh, buddhism buddhism or, you know uh, they are mostly yeah. are simply the traditional buddhists you know, even some don't, they call them Buddhist. Even they do not remember five precepts. No, uh, forget yes. about the eightfold noble path, four noble truth, and meditation. But whereas there are so many people, those who do not call themselves Buddhist, they do remember lots of chunks of uh, Buddha's teachings, yeah, and they are practicing more serious uh, on a meditation too. Yeah, and they have been to the retreats, meditation retreats, and you know, I studied dhammas. Uh, and in the West, in particularly, we have so many Buddhist scholars. They do not call themselves Buddhists, <laughs> but they are Buddhist scholars, and we yeah. have to rely on their work. Yeah. Yeah? So even at the center here, in our center, uh, uh, the classes that I run, meditation class or Buddhist studies classes most of them come to join they do not call themselves buddhist so when they leave god bless you ajahn like that so <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know so that's why it's uh, buddhism is not belongs to the buddhists it's belong to someone who is practiced and if someone is practicing in accordance with it then definitely there is a possibility of being enlightened yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. And Ajahn, just very interesting one as of just very recently and, and related to this uh, current situation and the, the situation that occurred in the USA. So mm -hmm. this one is uh, that how are you as a community responding to the current situations such as the lockdown and just Floyd protests? <laughs> this one, mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, George Floyd is very famous <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> <It's a question. laughs> I think one of the ladies uh, in relation to this uh, Black Lives Matter wrote an article saying that Buddha would respond differently and Buddha will change his teachings to respond to this uh, racism and you know, like that. But anyway, so when my response always been that if you are truly buddhists you know or if you are practicing buddhism first thing in you know, a first you will see a humanity mm. you know we all human beings rather than having any differentiation between like a nationalities race mm. you know ethnic groups or religious yeah. group we forget about all Buddha didn't didn't say that the Buddhism is belongs to only Buddhist or Buddha didn't say that it is belongs to Nepalese people or Indian people or Burmese people or Thai people or Sri Lankan people. Buddha didn't classify in this way like other faiths and religions does. So my response purely is if we are truly believing in human humanity, then you know there won't be any problem with the race. But again we cannot deny that each and every human beings are different. And based on that differences, we all have this driving to the greediness. And to get or to, to fulfill this greed, people will do every sort of things, <clears throat> even the harming other beings. And that's again, basically, against with the teachings of the Buddha in the first precepts, right? So. Uh, in relation to this current issue, again, you know, it's very sensitive, uh, but again, uh, we shouldn't be too much onto this, uh, that uh, this race or that race is good. But in fact, it's not just a black lives matter. It should be all lives matter and everyone should be respecting one another and their existence and practicing together as a humanity. And once we have come across together as all humans, then only then we are respecting the rules and regulation of in particular place of the city or the country. And then religion is our choice. We are practicing religion in our own accord of our own spiritual gain and spiritual comfort. But we shouldn't be taking this religion as the front page 
you know, before the nation or the culture, con community, uh, and the humanity. And that's how we can see how it's related. The very moment when we put the religion at front, we create differences between one another and religion and another religion, and we build up the conflict. And the same with the, uh, if we uh, do not take the religion at the front, but we take it as a humanity, then we all see as a one people. You know, we all have the same blood and the same nature like that. And with this, the race will just go away. Uh, mm -hmm. But if, whenever there is, then we do have to raise word and uh, raise voice. To, to illuminate and once it's done then again there, there must be different ways to do that rather than you know kind of a massive destruction destructive demonstrations in particular this lockdown time you know uh, it's not just uh, about individuals life that we should be thinking of but as a whole community you know each each uh, each and everyone's action does matter that affects to oneself and then to the other. So that's why if we take the Buddha's teachings, then we need to be very mindful of any actions that we take, whether that is beneficial for us or not, or whether beneficial for only to the others, or is it beneficial for both parties. And once we have understood clearly that this is beneficial for both parties, then we are again acting it with more kindness and compassion rather than our own emotion and you know greediness if we are reacting with our own emotion and greed then there is no difference than someone who, who had done in the past to uh, raise this you know, differences and uh, dominations uh, so-called yeah yeah <clears throat> it is very useful Fajan. and um Ajahn, this this one, this item also very interesting. I just got, you know, um, is about about science. You know, mm. how do Buddhists tend to feel about, you know, attempts to link Buddhist practice and ideas with science? For example, studying brain activity during meditation. Do they tend to believe, see science and their religion as uh, complementary or as fields of inquiry which should remain separate. This is about more science, Anajan. Uh, it's about uh, the brain and heart and our mind, how it's, you know, has come to be when we do meditation. Because as science proof or test, um, they believe that when we do meditation now, as our brain will change, you know, how do you respond to this uh, question, Prajan? <laughs> yes, because I have been in this meditation uh, section for some times, and I do come across with these things. And I do realize that there has been a, a lot of research going on, like a neuroscience, plasticity, yes. you know, brain surgery, and these things, even the heart surgeries that related to the, uh, the meditation and mindfulness in particular. When we look at the Buddha's teachings, it is not just for the current life's comfort. Buddha's medita Buddhist meditation is not about the current life comfort alone. Right? So whereas the current science technology that we are using to find how mindfulness meditation is good is you know, it's empirical and it's very good for this life, right? To get in you know, a comfort and in you know, an easy uh, or uh, get away from this anxiety and stress. And these are scientific research proven that if you are doing certain amount of meditation regularly, then it will help you, right? It will, it will help you to live happy life. Yeah. But these all are scientific findings are simply supporting for this life right but the practice of a meditation what buddha taught is not just for this life it's for the ultimate the liberation right so buddha is not talking about the physical benefit but he was more onto the mental benefit yeah. mm -hmm. and all the scientific research that have been done and has been doing and, the, and the, the outcome has come, it's simply supporting 
to keep our healthy body yeah. right in this life and also how to keep our mind into the positive yeah and then how to get more out of this life to be more happy and enjoy but whereas buddhist meditation is this is just a bypass you know this is just the outcome like a, a credit that we get it from but it's not the ultimate goal of a buddha's practice ultimate goal of buddha's practice is the mental liberation complete liberation from having any time to come you know, reborn again yeah. Yeah. so that's the two different uh, things that we have to show in the meditation that uh, uh, the scientific research are good for well-being in this life and we have to rely on that too but whereas a buddhist meditation is again meditation is a part of the eightfold noble path and this we have to follow and that is the leading towards the complete liberation the uh, unborn unconditioned state the nibbana that is the ultimate goal yeah. even in satipatthana you know clearly says there are these are the benefit of it but the scientific research benefits are also just for this life Then if, if they ask you about the heart, heart and mind and brain, how they relate to each other, this is also by Jan. Can you yeah, explain a little <laughs> bit about this? Our brain and heart. <laughs> scientific is, approach. Yes, it's quite, <laughs> yes, it's scientific. I normally, you know, uh, say that if we use our brain, we are using more conceptual things, perceptions. Yeah. when we use our heart we are living in the present moment mm -hmm. yeah. so the practice of a meditation that's why if we are using brain yeah you know, then basically we are you know going into the conceptions whereas if we are practicing from our heart then we are in the present moment relying in this present moment uh, awareness and now comes to the the scientific research and the uh, brain waves and the uh, hard things and things these are again probably may relate to uh, the our life but again our uh, focus shouldn't be on those things you know it's not just a physical gain i would say uh, practice of meditation and again research says uh, that if we are practicing meditation regularly our heartbeats uh, become a more normal Mm. You know, and even the brain system become a more uh, better into the positivity and more happier. And these are again, you know, basically the mind taking control over the body now. Uh, so as we meditate, you know, the mind become a more stronger and stronger and this will help to, uh, to the physicality. And there are research, you know, I heard, I, I read one of the research paper saying that if we are, if one person is meditating 15 minutes a day about 15 15 years then it will decrease they look like you know 10 years older than the actual their, <laughs> their age yeah and uh, when i was doing this uh, demystifying mindful course from sydney uh, the one of the papers says that if you are meditating 15 minutes a day every day uh, then uh, when you got old you know there is a very less chance where you will get the dementia uh, so uh, these are again the, on the this is based on the physical development and as well as physical decay which we cannot deny there will be and this is the buddha's teachings that the every this physical body or every part organs needs to decay once it's been created and it is very certain that uh, this will be changing but however mind is something that can help to make it less faster decaying than a uh, normal use uh, so the practice of meditation will help uh, in these situation and again i have a, a, a high blood pressure you know, and um, with the meditation i was able to maintain it for so many years until i got the thyroid you know and then after i got the thyroid i have to rely on a medicine and that 
again, medicine is helping me to make control. That doesn't mean I'm not meditating, right? So we have to uh, see in a holistic way, in that way. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's brilliant, my time. Yeah. I think, uh, whenever you have one, uh, this very good point. Thank you. <laughs> because, yeah. uh, you know, at the beginning of Mahasati Parnas, uh, Mahasati Patana Sutta is already said this, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Satana Visuddhi. Uh, yeah, Satana Visuddhi. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Beautify yeah. everything, not only the physical, no. yeah. even the, the mentality or the beautifyness. But but yeah. but it's good that the the scientific uh, research uh, come to prove this. Definitely, yeah. Yeah. scientific research yeah, are yes. really good, uh, encouraging people to come and meditate. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, because nowadays people believe science, scientists, you know, believe science. If science say this, the people will follow them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As now, right. because science is, uh, you know, developed or proved and very modern, then uh, now people are, you know, like um, reliant on science a lot. Yes, that's why, you know, when you are writing a paper, if you say that certain scientific paper suggests, yes. then immediately your psychological <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. is that. Whether, whether the writer is referring to the real scientific research or not, but it's just a word. <laughs> yes. I think, yes. you know, the Brahma Asina, the last time we discussed with uh, Tibetan uh, monks, oh, yes. he also yes. said that, uh, that the killer, the killer of religions uh, would be a scientist, <laughs> scientist. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, whenever I think we have friend, yeah, for one hour it's already. Oh. Yeah, uh -huh. one hour. Yeah, whenever Panyapoka, do you have anything to? I. Whenever I just uh, greeting you. Thank you for your presentation you. and very fascinating and very interesting. I have only one question. I personally, I have never been to Europe. Uh, I just have the question, but I just, you know, the follow half of your presentation. Uh, uh -huh. Just many activity and many different approach, yes. like uh, uh, interfaith, religious dialogue, mm -hmm. these kind of things. Mm -hmm. So now I just would like to assemble questions. Uh, I mean, to have doing the missionary work in Scotland. So what would be the, the challenge for, I mean, the, as a, a Theravada monks from Thailand, from Myanmar, uh, from Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. uh, it would be the language, like a language uh, barbarian or meditation experience, uh, like Buddhist knowledge. What, what would be the, the, the priority one uh, that we could have the qualifiers. Well, thank you. This question is really a good question. <laughs> <laughs> but I have been in Asia. I have been in uh, in Korea for two years, Singapore uh -huh. one year, Indonesia. It would be different from uh, Europe. I know. Too, so I just would like to simply uh -huh. ask these questions. <laughs> yeah. Well, you are most welcome to visit in Scotland or even uh, Oxford. I I applied visa, but it was rejected. <laughs> Oh dear! <laughs> yeah. I, I I tried to, you know, to come as a student for fellow for I think, uh -huh. I think 2016. Oh. So at that time, it's uh, it's, it was very difficult for uh -huh. any imams to to obtain the visa. Right. Okay. Sorry for yeah. hearing that. Maybe you can apply <laughs> okay. for the next time one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I believe I still can come. <laughs> right. So. Uh, my response will be first thing is the English language. Ah, yes. Okay, English language. But again, if you are going to stay in the uh, temples or viharas, which is mostly related to the ethnic groups like a Sri Lankan group or a Thai group, then ah, again, yes. you don't have to worry about the language either. Mm. Okay, they, yeah, they, have have their, <laughs> they have their own community. Yes. So that's why if you are thinking of working in a wider community and uh, uh, going into the, the local communities, then basically you have to have an English language. Okay? Uh, yes. And again, English language alone is not good enough. You have to yeah, know the yeah, Buddhist yeah. terminologies and how yeah. to 
you know, uh, how to pre you know, uh, present. Yes. So you have to have a sufficient knowledge about Buddhism too, and particularly Buddhist mm. meditation and how yeah. you relate it to the community at that place. So that, these are the two most important things. And yeah. then I would say that those who are coming here or in the West has to have very open-minded. Mm, yes, I, yes. I call it <clears throat> adaptation and yeah. adjustment. So yeah. and with that, what I have developed the, uh, my own understanding is that ability to accept people mm. yeah, yeah. and ability to Openness. accept their culture. Yeah. Mm. Yeah? Ability to accept the people, ability to accept their culture as they are. And yeah. ability to you know, mingle, adjust yeah, yeah. in that, mm. adjust in that community as they are in their community, but maintaining our own identity, the culture, the tradition, the paying respect to the Buddha, the chanting, the meditation, wearing the robes, eating on yeah. time, you know, like that. We maintain that. Yeah, and then, uh, so this adaptation, now we need to adapt some of the mm. the the uh, daily routines of their lives. So that's why one of the adaptation in the West, people, you know, all the Buddhist temples are doing is organizing a ceremonies on the Sundays. So wow. we do not organize yeah, yeah. ceremonies on our full moon days because people will not come. <laughs> oh, no, it would not come. <laughs> yeah, it will not come. So this is adaptation. We are adapting mm. their culture into the Buddhism, right? So yes. that is so we have to be very skillful way skillful in a way to adapt their culture into the Buddhism, and basically Buddhism is very good at adapting adapting in different adapting. cultures. And that's why we have you know Buddhism and you know, different yes. Buddhism. Yes, different right. Buddhism. So Buddhism different in Myanmar similar. is different than Myanmar Buddhism. Yeah. So Buddhism in Myanmar is basically exactly. the history, whereas Myanmar Buddhism is combined. You know, tuning in with the existing culture. So same yeah, thing yeah. in the West as well. Mm. We have to learn the skillful way of you know, tuning into their mm -hmm. culture. And that's how we have this you know, Buddhism. And that's why in my thesis, I mentioned at the end, my, my conclusion was wait until, you know, how this Buddhism become a Scottish Buddhism yeah, yeah, rather yeah, than Buddhism in Scotland. Scottish Buddhism so, and British Buddhism. <laughs> yeah, so that's why the second thing is we have to uh, know how to adapt the existing mm. culture of that place. Yeah. Uh, and, and then, and then and after that, uh, we have to adjust in their environment. So yeah. adjusting in their environment, like basically using English language, you know, and even wearing a jacket mm -hmm. or a clothes and you know, yes. having a boots on. Mm -hmm. uh, so and using English language to talk and communicate. So this is these are the adjusting in a you know mm. in a skillful way, and uh, this is I call you know respecting their culture, yeah, yeah. their people and their culture. So first accept adaptation and then you know uh, respecting their culture and seeing the value, you know, yeah. value of their uh, presence here, and then. You know, they are so much allowing us to be here and then working yeah. with them. So that's why we have to have this open minded and always, you know, learning with them and learning about them and mm. also uh, giving uh, the Buddha's teachings in a different forms and different ways for helping them. And yeah. again, Venerable, if you if you are giving more talks and involved with the Western people, you will see yeah. that English language has a different levels. Uh, yeah. you know? yes. And when you are explaining the Buddha Dhamma, you mm. have to use so many different, different you know, layers of the language to, uh, mm. to, to, to explain it. And uh, sometimes yeah. you use the, the, in the dictionaries or in our books, explain the teachings in certain words. But when you are mm. going to teach you know, at front, you have to mm. use different words in exactly. connection with that situation like that so yeah. you have to have english language and you have to have the good knowledge about 
Buddhism, Buddhism and also having an open minded. Open minded. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Thank a you, very Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So, venerable, what is um, what are struggles of being uh, Buddhist in the modern way in the modern society? They said, as you know, maybe some religion, some you know, followers of other religion, they found, they find the way in the modern society is different from the previous time in the ancient time. But now modern with the modern <laughs> science, is, uh, science thing, then maybe they have to change their way of teaching. Maybe but for Buddhists, <laughs> for Buddhists, we don't have to change, isn't it? It's all the Buddha, we have said it's the Buddha's teachings always, you know, like, um, you know, match to to uh, to wherever our uh, you know the yeah, yeah. times you know so mm. how do you uh, respond to this one venerable so yes so uh, when I was uh, uh, teaching Vinaya here at the center yeah and uh, uh, one of the students asked me why there are so many rules in Buddhism Buddhist. too much. <laughs> And then I mentioned that it is because monks are naughty. <laughs> yeah. And all the rules that Buddha laid down simply because monks has done something wrong. Yeah. Naughty monk and, can be sabaki. <laughs> yes. <laughs> sabaki. Yeah. Sabaki. <laughs> sabaki. <laughs> sabaki. Almost sabaki a rule. Well, yes, very, laid down very because of them. <laughs> Sabakis are very talented monks. They yeah. know how to twist and turn, right? <laughs> So then, uh, if Buddha is still alive, and probably you know, party moksha been increased into, you know, Edible. maybe two, three, three, mm. two, three thousand <laughs> rules. <laughs> yeah, but you know, in a Western world, you know, um, when we have to wear the jackets, they also asks, you know, in accordance with the Vinaya, you cannot wear a jacket. You know, in accordance to Vinaya, you can wear the you know, boots and so and so. But, you know, uh, it's uh, based on how you use, you know, how you skillfully use. Uh, so we have to use the, the so-called Mahapadesha you know, rule yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and uh, how this is Loka Vajja, you know, whether it is Loka Vajja or not. Yeah. You know, as long as it is still under this um, you know, skillful way or skillful means of the living and uh, and ad adapting and adjusting in this environment, then uh, it's fine. And I do not see that any, you know, trouble at all. Uh, it's more of a like, you know, even a, even uh, the, being a Buddhist monk is like a very very modern monk. That's why sometimes I call, you know, I am a modern monk. <laughs> modern monk. I think. Uh, I think we should monk. say. Rather yeah, than okay. saying that modern monk or professional monk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so that's why being a Buddhist in a modern world, uh, you know, there is no problem at all as long as we have the Vinaya that we are practicing in accordance with it. Uh, and uh, there is a skillful means of, uh, you, know, you know, changing, not a complete change, but, you know, adapting into the new society. Like, you know, you have to wear a robe you know, and on, no, sorry, jackets, you know, yeah. clothing. You know, otherwise, you won't be survive. And here in the winter, you know, you have to wear a proper um, the boots. Otherwise, you won't be able to yeah. walk. Uh, and you have a heating system at home. So otherwise, you will be, mm. you know, cold to Cannot death. Cannot survive. <laughs> yeah. So that's why yeah, I think uh, there is no problem with it as at all. Uh, it's based mm. on who is raising the question for what yeah, reason. Yeah. I, I, I think, uh, Venerable, earlier you have said uh, Mahapadesa, it is very important. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So with, with, with this, I think we, we, we had uh, mm. not much problem about this. Mm. So, yes, I think. I, I think, uh, you know, there were some some times ago, I was interviewed by one of the students from of Robert Gordon University and you know, asking that uh, whether it is, is it uh, easy to integrate in the society or new these Western customs or cultures. You know? And my response was that you know, as long as you know, we are very open-minded and rather than 
complaining or criticizing other cultures, you know, yeah. you're fine. You know? And Buddhism has given us this you know, vast you know, open space to you know, adapt and adjust yeah. in different situations, in different times. So yeah. that's why you know, it's like a Sangha. Anyone from yeah. any, anywhere around the world can come and join. Once you're joined, yes. you're all Sangha. <laughs> <laughs> Ohusana hitaya, yes. Ohusana sukaya, <laughs> for anyone. <laughs> okay, Venerable Bhante, I think it's our okay. time. It's really time. nice to see you, uh, Venerable. Yes. Yes. yes, nice to see you, and thank you very much for the invitation, Masena. Yeah. Very last one, Ajahn Suchan. Yes. Very last one, please suggest or tell, um, you know, our audience, our listeners here now, that okay. how you know during this COVID nineteen, how do you want to suggest them to like uh, to stay to live their life? Please, uh, for, for, for with the conclusion. Please. Oh, okay. Yes. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the COVID nineteen, you know, I have given uh, quite a lot of uh, talks uh, and uh, posted on YouTube and Facebook as well, and particularly I have um, separated. During this time, how do we should you know uh, cope with it based on the five precepts, uh, and these five precepts is the safeguard uh, for own own self and then for the family and as well as the community, as long as we are practicing in accordance with the five precepts. You know, we don't have to be too much serious practicing the five precepts, but at least sound practicing helps uh, to deal with yourself and then the family and uh, rest of other communities. And in terms of the stress and anxiety or and the boredom and these things, and it's very obvious that you will face it because you are not accustomed with it. Uh, now you have to stay in one small room or small house, you know, which is not accustomed to you and which may cause a lot of stress and problem and depression and also you know, as a cause of that emotional boiling into your heart and your mind cause the other problems in the family. That's how you know, domestic uh, violence has increased significantly and because you, uh, you know people are not able to cope with their emotions that has arisen or that has uh, come to face. So and during this COVID-19, in a way, those who are practicing meditation or those who know how to practice meditation would be the perfect time to develop more and more because mm. this time you cannot go anywhere. You don't have to go anywhere you know, and nothing to go, nowhere to go, nothing to do apart from your you know, family work or the working from the home. So in this time, rather than you know, just sitting and working and separating, you should withdraw yourself and just to watch your mind and are aware of your emotions and spend some time together as a family and uh, now doing this sort of a small practice of a meditation will help you and also if you reflect back in the past before the COVID-19 people were complaining that they didn't have time to spend with their families yeah no <laughs> time for my wife yes. no time for my yeah. children yeah. and now you got it That's... now you don't want to stay with them so it needs to be you know very mindful yeah. that that in that way so spend this time quality time with them and use it very you know uh, very skillfully so the most important thing at uh, this time would be knowing and seeing your own feelings and emotions and rather than let this emotion and feelings take control of your daily life you know you take control of it and you channel it. That's why all the Buddha's meditation is to take control of our emotions and feelings and then ability to channel into which way we want it to be. Yeah. So this is this would be my advice to you all. And most importantly, you know, there are so much uh, uh, domestic violence going on and there are so much mental problem going on due to this COVID-19 and simply because confined into the small limited place and it's this moment rather than thinking about outside internalize know yourself know your feelings and generate more love and compassion to yourself and as well as spreading it to the family 
and then the community. So this is your opportunity to change the whole world. Thank you, Vena. Very good advice. Okay. Thank you very much, Venerable Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, much for your invitation. Very thank you. you. Thank you very much. And thank you for all, you know, the audience. Your audience, for all who are watching. And yeah, today uh, we have very, uh, we are very fortunate to have Rajan Sushan from Warapunya Meditation, Buddhist Meditation Center from Aberdeen to give this, uh, you know, this uh, wisdom to us and we have learned a lot from this, so thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.